Uh, when Jen and I talked about how to present it, I got the easy part. I'm going to talk about the genesis of the book and what we're trying to do. She's going to actually have to talk about the book, so um, that's fair enough, I guess. Right? <laughs> they go together. Yeah. And one correction to the introduction. I do have the easiest job at the university. I'm retired, so I know it's <laughs> been, so that makes a difference. Uh, what I'd like to talk about is the genesis of this book, or a book. And I think there, uh, I'm going to highlight three things and bring it back to what happened with regard to this book. One is that we write because we think we have something to say, and we want to move the conversation forward. Right? Uh, now, you could argue that in some cases, if you're John Grisham, you write because you want to make money. But as an academic, I think you're here basically to move the conversation forward. But in many cases, I would argue that, that if you've got that as your mission, that's not enough, because there is what I call a kind of publication ecology that you have to think about in terms of, and I'll highlight some of that in a minute, uh, you know, who's going to publish it? And how am I going to get the time to do this? Does my department give me the time to do this? Is this, is this part of the culture of the enterprise that I'm in? All of those really are going to in influence uh, you know, your decision of how you're going to present something, whether it be in book form or publication form. And the other is that once you've written the book and you've achieved the goal that you set out to, I think you've got to, even before you start at that, you've got to ask yourself, what next? What, you know, what, what am I going to do after this is over? Have I said the final word? And I'll just give you a very brief story on this. A number of years ago, more than I would like to remember, I was chairman of the geography department at the University of Oklahoma. And we had what I thought was a real coup. We, we, we were going to bring David Harvey in to give a seminar. I suspect most of you know who David Harvey is. Uh, but I bet you don't know what his first book is, which is called Explanation in Geography, which was a classic defense of deductive reasoning. I mean, it was, it was really taking apart, you know, the whole logic of deductive reasoning. So we'd invite him in to talk to that because it was kind of the thing in geography that time. When I picked him up at the airport, I, you know, chatted with him and said how delighted we are. And, you know, that you could speak to this book. And he says, oh, I'm not going to speak to that. I'm through with that. I don't want to do with that anymore. I just had to get that out of my system. And he never got back to that. You know, he went on, I think you could arguably say, better things, uh, better books. But he had a, he just had to write it to get it out of his system. And, but then he knew where he wanted to go after he'd written it. So think about that as you do that. So what about this book, the machine book? Um, what was the motivation behind it? It was basically to critique the concept of resilience. Uh, at the time um, when we started this project, there was a lot of literature out there on resilience from a variety of disciplines, ecology, engineering, psychology, you name it. It was, it was the in word at the time. Uh, and, and there was a phenomenal growth in interest in the concept at the public policy level. Uh, there was a famous article in the New York Times that says it's no longer about sustainability, it's about resilience. And, you know, there was the Rockefeller Foundation 100 Resilient City Program, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it was really generating a lot of interest. Um, but at the same time, rightfully so, there was a lot of critiquing of it. What does this really mean, as a, as, particularly as a policy concept? And, and much of that critique was coming out of international studies and social sciences, et cetera, uh, rather than in the ecology or engineering framework. Uh, and believed, and the arguments being presented was that this was a classic neoliberal concept and was being used by the establishment to kind of promote their agenda, whatever that agenda is, that resilience became the way to do that. Right? Um, so the question becomes, if that's true, who are the actors? What is the mechanisms? What is the machinery, if you like, for that to be achieved? Well, that was really, that's where the metaphor resilience machine came about, and it really um, quite frankly, came about between a conversation of myself and a colleague who's 
you know, uh, many of you know Paul Knox, on a beach someplace. We were chatting about this, and he, he, he came up with the idea because he was very familiar, many of you may be, with Woolwich's notion of the growth machine in urban economic, urban development. Woolwich uh, wrote this famous book uh, and became very well known is that development, urban development was a function of a machine that consisted of developers, politicians, you know, the construction people, etc., all kind of shaping what the development mechanism would be for a city. So our view was that concept may be germane here, and that's the origins of the concept in the terms of the machine, which we later changed, and I'll explain why in a minute. So that was the genesis of the book, uh, the idea of the book. The ecology to, to support this, and remember, this is an edited book with a number of authors, and one of the things that take pride is that some of the folks in this, like Julian and so on, are really eminent scholars to think. But the ecology of it that made it all possible was six, seven years ago when I had stationed in Northern Virginia, we had something called the Center for Security and Resilience, urban, headed by a fellow by the name of Jack Harrell, who was very well known in that field. So we started doing a series of international workshops where the intent was to bring people in from a range of disciplines range of backgrounds, that is, practitioners, politicians, uh, academics, to sit down and talk about this concept in a variety of different ways. And we did that for about, uh, continuing on through the Global Forum, for about eight years. We brought all these people together. And so the ideas and the authors for this book really come out of that set of meetings we used to have. And in fact, uh, to my knowledge, there are now three books, three edited books. This one, we were doing another one at the same time with this, uh, some other people on theory and practice of resilience. And another one that's going to come out with Oxford Handbook in terms of somebody was there. So that was the gender. We, I mean, we were, it was a great way to do it. And in particular, with an edited book, if you've ever written or edited a book and or written or read and in a book, it can be very choppy, boom, boom, boom. Uh, and I don't claim that this one is really smooth, but they can be very choppy. One of the things that we decided to do, the three of us, the editors, is we had another workshop where everybody who we invited to give a paper, or to, to give a chapter, had to write that chapter and come to a workshop and defend it and present it before everybody else. That was a great way to try to smooth it out. Tim was there. You can remember that, that conversation we used to have. Uh, and what we found is well, two things. Number one is we eliminated a lot of superfluous verbiage because everybody wanted to start their chapter with, and this is resilience, blah, 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 blah. And so we said, no, no, we'll do that in the first. You start out with the meat of it, which left some of them a little bit disconcerted because they liked filled about 15 pages with the genealogy of the subject matter, but uh, we said, no, we'll handle that. And the other thing that it did was, after lots of discussion, decided that the concept of machine probably was not a good one, or the language. And so as Jen will tell you, what we really settled on is, is resilience as an assemblage process. And we're drawing a lot on assemblage theory to think about how it evolves in a particular place. And then the last thing, and then I'll turn it over to Jen here, is when we organized the book, we organized it by scale. That is, we wanted to look at resilience across scales, from the individual, and there are some chapters in here that deal with imagination from, from a standpoint of the individual. Um, uh, Rebecca Hester has a great chapter on the human body as a machine and how it's manufactured to be more efficient. So individual, the community, the national, to a kind of theoretical scale. That was the intent. Um, so um, that became the kind of organizing theme, and that became the direction we gave to every author to say, think about this. You're here, you're here, you're here, okay? 
Jen, you want to take it? So, something that's in the history that Jim didn't mention um, is that resilience became part of the university mission here um, after the massacre in 2007. And so, um, when I finished my PhD in Aspect, I went over to the Global Forum on Resilience, where the work that we were doing was really thinking about how communities cope after crisis. And of course, we never talk about the gun crisis, but we talked about lots of other types of crisis. And um, I say that now because um, with the passing of Dr. Steger and Jen retiring, the Global Forum's mission is changing. and. Um, I think it's important for us to not forget why resilience became part of our university mission and uh, what resilience can do um, for us and also um, in making us uh, maintaining vulnerability in a lot of ways. So um, I just want to start with a famous quote about resilience. So if you've ever been around New Orleans, um, you may have seen a poster uh, that's been posted up in a lot of places. Um, so this is a quote from Tracy Washington. She says, stop calling me resilient because every time you say, oh, they're resilient, that actually means that you can do something else, something new to my community. We are not born to be resilient. We are conditioned to be resilient. I don't want to be resilient. I want to fix the things that create the need for us to be resilient in the first place. And so that was a quote that really took um, took off after Hurricane Katrina, and a lot of the literature on resilience developed in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, uh, because a lot of the discourse was like, look at these resilient people. This place can rebound from this storm. But what that storm demonstrated was decades of intergenerational poverty, um, the fact that people didn't have the tax ticket to their house, so they weren't able to go back home. Um, that the way that their lives were counted uh, or enumerated was marked on their on the front of their housing houses or what was left of it rather than really understanding the life that had happened there and the livelihood that had happened in those places and so when we start thinking about where resilience come from comes from um, we started thinking quite a bit about how resilience can be used and is put forth as an inoculation against uncertainty. Um, and so when you first hear resilient, you think, that's a great quality. I want to be resilient. Um, doesn't everybody? It's, it's, a, it's a desirable trait um, that a lot of us aspire to. It's, it's prevalent now, uh, especially within sports. So if you watch ESPN on Sunday morning, game day, you'll hear all about resilience and how people come back from their injuries, and that's a great thing. So resilience really has become a way for us to think about uh, pushing back against uh, vulnerability, uh, pushing back against insecurity, and it's offered as an inoculation. So when we started to think about how resilience works um, discursively, materially, we looked a lot around the way that resilience is used as a form of power and control. So how does the language circulate and where does it come from? As Jim mentioned, it's within public policy circles for sure, but it's also within toolkits. So a lot of grant money goes to establishing these toolkits that communities can use to embed or generate more, more resilience, often to uh, environmental conditions, so sea level rise, um, things that we think are immediate immediate sort of needs. Um, but also, you see resilience coming up in circles around NGOs. There's a lot of NGO conversations on this. And it's also become part of public policy financing. Um, builders use this term. Um, construction magnates use this term. Um, so it, it's a material way of thinking about how we build how we finance, how we go about creating the places where we live and work. So here, um, in thinking about resilience, we think about how, with that framing, security, whether that's financial or environmental or you know, in your own body, um, becomes a matter of personal choice rather than a matter of 
the circumstances and conditions around you. And so um, a really interesting example that I saw in New Orleans about this was, uh, have you guys seen the pothole repair kits um, that are offered by like Home Depot or those? So the, the streets are pretty bad, right? So you've seen the paving for pizza ads that Domino's puts out? Okay, so anyway, these are two ways where a really simple thing that's going on in the community, um, potholes. You should just go down to Lowe's and get your own pothole repair kit rather than having your tax money um, necessarily go to this. And now Domino's has taken this up as a way to ensure that their driver's cars aren't being damaged as they deliver pizza. So if you, if you have a pothole in your street, let Domino's know. They'll come and patch it for you. They'll put their stamp on it. And then uh, you know they can continue their work um, unimpeded. So I thought that was like a really interesting way to just think about how we're responsibilized as individuals for um, creating resilience within our communities. So we also think in the book quite a bit about the values and ideology that resilience narratives carry with them. We're not dismissing resilience completely. We do find that there are some spaces um, for liberatory potential still within discourses of resilience, but we question the way that uh, values are carried within discourses of resilience. Um, and this is something that we saw previous, uh, previously within discourses of sustainability. So Tim Wu has done a lot of work on this to articulate the way that sustainability has become co-opted in order to really um, maintain the conditions of production. What we're sustaining isn't necessarily um, environmental goods, it's not necessarily the health or wellness of communities. It's not the citizenry. What we're sustaining is capital accumulation. And so through many of the same processes and uh, ways that the sustainability discourse has moved and been adapted, we found that resilience has also um, gone that way. And so um, I think that we think in the we, in the end of the book, we start to think about what happens after resilience, because as Jem said, there's sort of these two camps. There's the ecology camp that uses resilience as thinking about bouncing back. What are the, what are the sort of like ecological systems? Bouncing back, bouncing around, bouncing forward. There's lots of bouncing in the literature on resilience generally. And so basically we're arguing that bouncing back to the previous condition is not what we want because the condition is what is necessitating the resilient subjectivity in the first place. Um, and this happens on multiple levels. And Rebecca Hester, uh, one of our colleagues in science and technology studies, talks about how this works at the molecular level um, and within, um, within the military to sort of secure soldiers' bodies and change minds in order to make them more, uh, more resilient, more able to engage in the security of the nation, which I think connects a lot to the work that you're doing here. Um, and really, um, this is why we've moved from like the scalar analysis to more of the assemblage of analysis in the book, because it does happen at different sites and scales, but these are all interconnected. Um, and they all sort of like weave in and flow in really uh, sort of messy ways. The thing that I want to say about how now resilience, so it, we went from sustainability, which was co-opted, to resilience, which was co-opted. Now we're moving toward the Anthropocene. So this is the new discourse, this is the new buzzword. Um, and this is also a way to naturalize what's happening environmentally and socially. So these words carry with them, they're not neutral words, they carry with them a lot of weight and a lot of power to think about um, where we're gonna locate responsibility. So in the end, we basically are making an argument that rather than looking at the way that resilience operate, looking at the way that resilience operates is important, but what we need to do within that is to locate responsibility. Because responsibility is able to be located even within the fuzziness of these words. Um, yeah, so examining the disproportionate ways that certain subjects are created and formed within that, within that fuzziness often means that we, we don't think about locating accountability. We think that this is something that just happens. 
Um, Katrina is a good example. You can think about Appalachia as an example of this. Um, and this is often a discourse that's um, launched after a disaster. Uh, so, so it forecloses the possibility for us to understand what the conditions are that were creative, which were productive of that disaster in the first place. Um, so these are multiple things. It's a traveling concept. It's going to morph. Um, we'll see what happens with resilience. I don't think that we should throw it out. Uh, because it does have the potential to ask questions about um, the conditions. And I hope that we will be able to carry that on in some way here at our university. Great. Thanks a lot to Ben.